Uh, my name is Michelle Lee. I'm the director of the Master of Business Analytics program. I've been at MIT for over 10 years now, and I started the program back in 2016 with our faculty committee. Um, and I'm ex so excited to welcome um, amazing faculty, female faculty professors here today. Um, so here today we have three faculty members who will present about their research and their work. Uh, first, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Georgia Barakis um, with her very long title that you can read here. <laughs> um, Georgia, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, uh, I actually joined the faculty many moons ago, unfortunately for me, because this shows that I'm old, in 1998. And um, I have been teaching since then um, many in many programs, but one of my favorites uh, is the Masters of Business Analytics, which is also part of the Operations Research Center that uh, I'm also the co-director for. Can we go next? So it's it's really my pleasure to see everybody, but uh, maybe we click next. But what is my research about? Oops, no, before, prior, sorry. Oh. I don't know if there's a way that I do it, but uh, yeah. But my area is basically in the intersection uh, of optimization with machine learning. And in particular, uh, over the past many years, I've been looking at applications in the areas of pricing and the retail space, supply chain, and in the recent several years, also in the space of uh, healthcare. I, and as a result, I'm working with different companies that actually MBAN students get involved as uh, research assistants. And it's really a fun way for them to kind of put what they learn in practice and see what doing research that can have impact in all of these organizations can be about. Some of these companies in the retail space include, for example, Zara, uh, include General Motors, but also hospitals like Humas General Hospital, uh, Tampa General Hospital, and so forth. Uh, can we go next? So let's actually give you a concrete example in this space that I work on. Uh, so a big question that, for example, Zara has is they are about fa fast fashion. It's about basically sending items, new items to the store twice a week. And they want to, they need to display them on the floor. So the question is, which existing items on the floor should they remove to make room for these uh, new items to display? So these are new items. And a big question is, in order to see what to display and what to remove, you need to understand the demand. But for new products, you don't have data. So you need to use some sort of a proxy. So just applying um, a good old, say, random forest or neural network, which will not work if you don't have data, you need somehow to find what are those proxies and how can you predict the demand well on that. And then you need to use optimization in order to determine what are the right items to, to send, what are the right items for the managers to, re, to uh, remove. And if that wasn't complicated enough, in addition, uh, the managers don't necessarily optimize. In fact, we have seen that in different countries, managers exhibit different behavior. So uh, the headquarters of Zara need to be smart and try to predict what is the manager behavior in terms of what type of uh, items they will remove in order to send the right ones to them. So behavioral um, uh, things come into play that you also need to predict the manager behavior. Can we click next? So here is how you actually, oops, before that. So how do you predict with little to no data on new items? How can you understand the behavior of managers, especially when it's different than, than optimal? So you see this problem, there's two levels. The level of the headquarters that need to understand what is the right action to them, the optimal action, but then to also, uh, incorporate the behavior of the managers at the second level. 
in the optimization language, this is called a bi-level optimization problem. And these are problems that are notorious hard problems to solve in optimization. I just thought that I would give you here a little bit of a sense of an area that has an industry collaboration, Zara. We work very closely with them. The students participate in meetings with them every couple of weeks. They get to work with me and a PhD student. They get their hands dirty with the data, but also they get their hands and their creativity in the picture in terms of basically building models, predictive models that involve machine learning, optimization models that uh, include some of the items that I mentioned. I think I was told that I have uh, three minutes, so I don't know if I have more time. I don't want to overtake the other speakers. Michelle? Um. I think we can move move on to the next uh, presentation and then we can come right. back with additional Great. questions. So maybe you want to click very maybe. quickly the next two slides and then we go to the next speaker. Uh, yes. So... Oh, yes. Yeah. So our next uh, professor is Chara Podmata. Um, Chara, would you like to present your slides? Yes, hello. I, my name is Hara. So to pronounce it correctly, it's a hard name, I know. Uh, you just ignore the C in front of it. Uh, no worries about it. Um, okay, I'm I'm a newbie. So I joined uh, in June this year and I'm already in the deep. So I'm teaching uh, one of the MBA core classes. It's called Data Models and Decisions. Basically, the uh, class punchline is that uh, once you have data and you can build models, on the data that you have, then uh, you can make better decisions uh, that are not affected by your human biases. Um, and yeah, we can make better decisions. So the class, to give you an idea, it teaches the basics uh, about the hierarchy of analytics. And basically it assumes no background, uh, no technical background. So we have students uh, that haven't played with data ever in the past. Um, we first uh, go through this describing descriptive analytics, where we document, summarize, and understand uh, the past data from a system. Uh, then we cover predictive analytics, where we discuss methods like, you know, things that you might have heard, regression, classification methods, about how the system will respond to future changes using data-driven models. And finally, we cover prescrip prescriptive analytics, where we optimize the system given reliable predictive models that we have built in the past. So in the wonderful example that Georgia gave us uh, before, in descriptive analytics, you would describe the retail data set that you have. In predictive analytics, you would use this description and the model that you built in order to predict future sales or whatnot. And then in prescriptive analytics, you would optimize uh, the system based on these predictions in order to maximize, for example, future profit. Um, and yeah, so this is a class that uh, uh, folks get in their first year uh, in the MBA. My research now, uh, I do research in human facing algorithmic decision making. Um, I'm sure all of you in this audience here today know that uh, algorithms are used right now to make consequential decisions about our lives. And this happens every day, whether it's for recommendation systems or it is for decisions about our loan um, and so on and so forth. So what happens in this pipeline is that uh, in the center, you have algorithmic decision-making and humans supply their features, their data into these systems in order to be judged by these systems. And the features that they supply can be, for example, demographics, their credit history, and so on and so forth. And once you have uh, these features being fed in the system, the system runs some complicated models and outputs decisions. For example, it decides whether you are approved for a loan, whether you can be hired for a job, benefit allocation, recommendations, and so on and so forth. Now, because of the fact that these decisions are so consequential in people's lives, we've seen, and it has been very well documented in many different industries, that individuals oftentimes misbehave in various ways when they submit their features into these systems. And some examples of misbehaving individuals that my research uh, studies 
is agents that strategize with their data in order to try to fool the algorithm uh, that is being deployed, agents that are sometimes completely irrational or unpredictable with what they're doing with the data, uh, or agents that do strategize, but not with a fixed horizon in mind. So they are what we call non-myopically strategic. And so to give you a very quick and dirty idea of what the pipeline uh, of my research looks like, I study three uh, basic viewpoints. The first viewpoint is how does this misbehaving from the side of individuals affect the decisions that we are making and how can we learn to make better decisions? How can we design algorithms that are robust to these types of misbehaving individuals? The second poll of my research is to study the effects of these decisions to society when they are made by algorithmic systems and individuals may be misbehaving in order to try to fool these systems. And finally, uh, the third pillar of my research is to study these questions from a policy and regulation perspective, because policy and regulation uh, has become increasingly important when it comes to AI decision making, and we're going to see way more of that uh, in the future. And this affects, of course, and constrains the types of algorithms that we can use in order to make decisions. That was all for me. Uh, thank you, Hara. And uh, next, we have Professor Swati Gupta. Hope I'm saying that correctly. Go ahead, Swati. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle. And uh, um, excited to speak to you all. I am also a newbie like Hara, but really in disguise because I uh, was at Georgia Tech as a faculty for five years before I moved here in July this year. And uh, my research is about understanding ethical decision making and new trends in cutting edge technologies and optimization, machine learning, and AI. And uh, it really connects back to what Hara said and, and uh, what uh, Professor Paraki said in terms of you know, analytics driving a bunch of decisions, all of a, a large fraction of decisions in our day to day lives where we interact with automated decision making. And the question is, how does it impact lives? And can we uh, use analytics? But can we use analytics for Im in improving social good? So if you go to the next slide, here I have uh, some examples of the news that you know you might have seen, like Amazon uh, said uh, they will bring same-day delivery to Roxbury after an outcry. Why did this outcry happen? Because if you if people looked at the Amazon's same-day delivery patterns, where did Amazon provide same-day delivery across various geographical regions? They saw that there was some correlation with people's income or race, where they did not uh, uh, provide same-day delivery service, and that seemed discriminatory. Or in another example, where ProPublica studied discriminatory pricing algorithms, this was a study for Staples, prices offered by Staples, where they looked at uh, which uh, computer a user is signing in from. If it's a MacBook, they would charge higher price. If it was a Windows laptop, they would charge a lower price. And uh, so that created uh, this, uh, uh, this study where uh, it seemed like pricing algorithms were being discriminatory. And the third example I want you to keep in mind is the feedback aspect. So rating systems, like I'm sure all of us have used some form of ride sharing services like Uber or Lyft. And here's an example of a study which showed that rating systems may, may actually incorporate biases that we have as humans. And now all of the features that Hara spoke about that go into your algorithm these features actually incorporate the biases uh, of ratings that other individuals might have on Uber drivers, right? So that now that feedback from other people is also incorporated in the data for every human. And the question I'm interested in is, if you go on the next slide, given all of this data that is generated through socioeconomic processes, our behavioral patterns, our evaluations of people, and if this data goes into optimization, machine learning, and AI algorithms, then what is the impact of these uh, of these decisions on people, on human well-being? And this is a highly interdisciplinary field. It is uh, very relevant today. 
uh, we want to create systems that don't propagate our own biases at a very large scale and can be used for improving the good in the world and and you know not uh, 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 not diminishing access to good jobs access to good education and so on so uh, to give you an example of uh, uh, my research if you go on the next slide here are the kind of uh, questions I think about. Uh, so cutting edge algorithms and OR and statistics and how do you incorporate an ecosystem of power, uh, power systems, supply chains and, and so on, but ask questions that if you click uh, once more, you will see. Uh, so what are, how can we define fairness? What is the impact of bias on the in data? Can we create uh, operations research methods or analytics for policy impact? How can we do districting or gerrymandering? How does it impact healthcare? So there is just a lot of areas and a, a, a lot of exciting applications that you all can get involved in. And uh, of course, all of this is uh, not in isolation compared to the changing legal landscape. So that also forms very interesting uh, set of questions and challenges that we are actually seeing in today's applications. And um, in particular, I wanted to give you this example of organ transplantation, which is a project uh, that we are working on. If you go on the next slide, um, uh, this project is just recently started, and we have two fantastic MB analytics students, Raghav and Kevin, who are involved in this project. We also have a graduate student, we have a postdoc, and we have meetings with our partners in MGH, uh, where we are trying to understand how uh, the organ transplantation system works in the US, and how uh, there might be biases that uh, uh, percolate in various decisions of getting viable organs to patients who actually need these uh, in a time critical aspect. So we are developing different parts of this system so that we have equitable access and as uh, 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 which, is, which is as robust as possible. So I'm, I'm going to uh, stop here and thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you, uh, Swati and all the professors. Um, I think I'll just start with a question that came from um, a student here. The question is about generative AI. Uh, so can you give a, some color on the trend in data analytics, on the methodologies, data types, and how generative AI will be impacted and applied to your research? Absolutely. So generative AI is uh, uh, super uh, interesting from, from a technical aspect and from a scalability aspect. And we are seeing a lot of, uh, first of all, we are seeing a lot of issues on the trustworthiness of data that is generated by generative AI, right? So can we trust uh, the data and how can we audit these systems? That's, I guess, the, the first uh, set of questions. But the second set of questions is also like when we have regimes where there is only small data, can we positively use generative AI to augment that data and have faster decision making or, or more reliable decision making in some sense? So um, uh, I, I think uh, we are also seeing a lot of generative AI use in, in teaching and classrooms. And I think that's just opening up new kinds of challenges and questions and uh, you know new forms of learning that faculty at Sloan are uh, highly cognizant to. Thank you. Um, Professor Paracas or Podomato? And especially, I will agree <clears throat> how uh, I talked already myself about little data before and how it will actually, generative AI can help augment little data is very important. Uh, but also I can see in healthcare, uh, you know, recommending and helping doctors making say notes. And there are many other applications that many of us are delving into because of the the new world that we are working in, but the ethics also of it is something that we are thinking about in our research, but also in terms of teaching, but also on the positive side, how to use it in the classroom to help the students uh, and not just think of the negative parts. I think in all of these things, you have to think of not just the negatives, but also the positives that new technology bring, brings. Mm -hmm. So actually, in my class that we're teaching, we're using uh, we're using a lot of generative AI, and I have created a bunch of assignments uh, using uh, ChatGPT. 
um, uh, like something that's a fan favorite, I would say, with my students is that we have a bunch of uh, notions, like a bunch of paradoxes, that the idea for understanding what the paradox is under underlying the data is rather tricky. So I asked, for example, ChatGPT to generate to me an example that explains a particular paradox. Uh, in that case, it was Simpson's paradox. And I asked it to generate an example from an e-commerce company. And ChatGPT made a very, very slight mistake that was crucial. So we just posted everything and like gave it to the students and the students basically scrutinized the output. And I think they have not understood like a, another notion as, as, as best because it was like so, so minimal, like the change of what, what uh, ChatGPT did. Uh, other than that, I use a lot of uh, generative AI on my research and I try to kind of also use it as a force for good, um, surprisingly. So I'm um, working a lot with like using generative AI agents as auditing mechanisms in order to generate appropriate data in order to audit platforms. And I'm also delving more into the area of using generative AI uh, to help us do more uh, social science related experiments about how, you know, the human generated data are uh, as opposed to the uh, machine generated data and how close they are and whether we can essentially use uh, machine generated data to help researchers and you know optimization algorithms like instead of asking for human data to have these like hallucinated data instead great thank you uh, very interesting uh, i think another question here as this is a women's panel and you are all um, amazing, talented female faculty is what kind of support system does MIT provide you or or um, from your past uh, career before MIT to get you to where you are here, here now as a faculty member? What kind of support for women have you experienced? Maybe I go first since I'm by far the oldest in age. <laughs> which that's a positive comment for the others, not for me. <laughs> so um, so I think that at least the biggest support that I got over the years were the other women um, in the faculty, but also the female students in the different programs. Um, so of course, when I started, there were not that many females, but this is many, many years ago, things have changed drastically you see my two phenomenal colleagues that are here today with me. So, and others who are not here with me today, but, uh, you know, I think it's uh, the fact that we now have a community that um, helps and uh, being able to go to the elder women, even if they were not in my area earlier on and ask for advice, that actually helped me a lot. And it was a huge source of support. Uh, the fact that after I started, the dean's office established a mentor program, so I had a mentor that I could go to and talk to. So these were some of the things um, that I think helped me. Uh, Swati or Hara? So uh, for me, coming from India, I often heard things like, you know, my parents People would tell my parents, why do you want her to be an engineer or a mathematician? Like, shouldn't she do some more humanities or something so she could be a nice homemaker? Uh, so I think the first uh, set of uh, first uh, strong support was from my parents and uh, family and, uh, of course, mentors uh, throughout uh, my career. And um, specifically, I think in Boston, it's uh, super nice because I think the average age of people in Boston is around 30. Uh, it's a very uh, dynamic, vibrant, young com community. We have uh, so many universities. You see such a wide, diverse uh, student population. I think Boston is more diverse than any other uh, city I've been to in US. So uh, that also like helps, uh, you know, there's so many activities that helps uh, uh, have a nice set of friends. Uh, I guess you don't uh, feel like you are, uh, uh, Georgia has always been a big role model for me, being like a senior faculty in, uh, at Sloan and in, uh, in OR statistics. And uh, uh, a lot of, I think, uh, even faculty members across MIT have uh, been uh, amazing role models. Within MIT itself, I'm trying to remember, like as students, I uh, used to volunteer for Aid Boston. There were activities at MIT Museum. 
there's uh, there's so many interesting clubs here there was a hogwarts flying school club or something there's so many interesting clubs here that you know you you find your uh, cheerleaders and your uh, friend circle and it's i i just think it's a great community to be a part of so i i would say uh, maybe add that on uh, to George's uh, question, uh, answer as well. For me, honestly, the most important thing is like, I know that I'm repeating like George's points, but it, it's been the people, right? Like it's uh, because it's our work environment and we like spend, devote so much of our lives and we like to do it. Like, it's not something that, I don't know, we're privileged to be doing the job that we like doing. And so when we have people around like Georgia as well, she has been a great like mentor and role model for me too. And she, I mean, she has helped me. I, I think I was like at some point in the beginning of this semester, because again, I'm a newbie. I'm teaching for the first year. I was telling Georgia, I was like, I think I asked Georgia about like, what is hap what's going to happen? Like, what should I expect or whatnot? Um, yeah, so I think I think that, that that has been like a big support, the people around and how the other thing that's really important is that everyone is willing to listen, which is super important and you're not treated as a person like I'm the youngest around here and there are so many like super famous people that are emeritus professors now or whatnot and they just treat you with like uh, more like so much respect and so much like they just listen to all the ideas that you have and what you're bringing to the table the new perspective or, or whatnot which is like very important and then of course it's on a like uh, a case by case basis. Um, like I had an example, for example, where I uh, was teaching something in the material and I found that, you know, maybe we could have a more inclusive way to teach about this topic. And I brought it up with the co-instructors and the response was overwhelmingly positive. They were like, oh, we hadn't realized that this was potentially an issue and thank you for bringing it up. Like, so yeah, I think it's, a great place. Oh, that, yeah, that's great to hear. And we all, always hear from our students how down to earth the professors are and willing to take the time. So thank you to all three of you for um, being very welcoming. Um, I have another question um, that's not on the list, but I think would be appropriate for this panel is about the students themselves. So over the years, if you, as you've taught many students or worked with TAs or with your research assistants, what makes a great research assistant or a great student? What kind of qualities are you looking for when you step into the classroom or when you do research with a student? Go ahead, Georgia. I start and then uh, I will leave a lot of points for everybody else, but I think the most important feature is to be excited about what we do together and to be willing to put the effort on it. We are not like expecting that you're going to start and you're going to know everything or anything like that. But there are so many students I see over the years that they are really excited about what we are going to be doing together and they put the effort on it because they are excited. And that makes them successful in the long run. I completely agree with what Georgia said. Um, I think when I started as a faculty, I preferred having students who had much more of a background than students who are less prepared. But I realized that actually the confounding factor was enthusiasm and passion for what you were doing. And if students actually enjoyed the project, then they would pick up any skill that was needed for that project and they would make it happen. And that excitement shows and, and every everybody in the team is much more excited to be working on things. You know, that's how you get creative ideas. You get ideas of how to do things better or more efficiently or differently. And you are you view the problem from multiple lenses. You're willing to go out and, you know, read news about it, read papers about it, read critique papers about it. Right. So I think enthusiasm is the the, as Georgia said, like the the first most important factor. And the second factor is. Definitely, like if you've worked with some data before, if you've had some uh, 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 some mathematical background to speak, build up that same language as is needed for the project, those factors definitely help. But if you don't have that, I'm confident that everybody who's in the program can develop those things. Um, 
it's really hard to uh, uh, fake passion in some sense. Yeah. Yeah, jumping up from uh, Swati's last point about like everyone who's in the program is in some sense qualified. I'm a huge believer in that. Too. Like I believe that everyone who gets admitted is extremely, extremely uh, qualified. And so that's not what makes a great student or extremely and a very good RA to me. I mean, it is passion, yes, but there's also something that, um, I don't know, I, I think I'm gonna call it that the student feels safe and included, that they don't feel that, uh, you know, they are just um, uh, data machines or like algorithm machines. Uh, so yeah, I think students that feel safe and included to voice concerns and bring their own perspectives and they're not just executing machines but you know they're they're uh bringing their unique like experiences to to projects i think for me these are the most uh successful students mm -hmm. great um so you do talk about some coding and some algorithms there's a lot of questions here in the forum about how technical do you expect the students to be and how much knowledge do you expect your research assistants to come in with and what kind of technical experience is important to you so can I you think, give sense yeah, yeah so i think that first of all overall the program is quite technical you're going to be taking courses together with phd students many times so it's not the the the, the n in the mban is really an important letter although it's small do not take that letter out. <laughs> it's a master's in business analytics program, uh, really. Now, but we do, and the same with the research that, you know, because what we do is machine learning and optimization in applications, obviously it's gonna help you have a head start to have some background. But for example, many students come in and they have machine learning background. Not everybody has optimization background and, many, and the projects do ask for that, but, it's not a problem because first of all, in the fall, you take your courses and already by November, people are capable of working in the research uh, uh, on these things. And then we will also spend time to make sure we train you and you have the background to do it. I, I of course, I'm speaking on my own projects, but I'm pretty sure that's true for everybody else here. But uh, yeah, but it is a technical program. It's not uh, you know a soft program. So maybe just to give an example uh, of what Georgia said, uh, Kevin and Raghav are the two students who are working on the project with me uh, on organ transplantation. And they both have uh, some background to uh, write some Jupyter code for Jupyter notebooks. And when we started this project, all they had to do was, you know, initialize some arrays, initialize like uh, a graph, which I told them what it is, uh, to think about uh, various uh, data variables that we have in the project, uh, look at the flow of how different variable is being used. But really the optimization part of it, it's coming now, late October and November. And by then they've already run optimization, like small optimization, you know, optimization programs in the classes. They're actually ahead of us in the class. Like they know what network simplex is. They've, they've picked up a lot of tools uh, in their uh, optimization methods class that they are very excited to apply to this project. So they did not start with that background, but that, but they had, they still had some working knowledge of uh, uh, Python for Jupyter notebooks. Right. Um, okay, so there's a um, more uh, philosophical question in the chat, which is for the professors, how do you balance intuition versus quantitative data when aiming to use data for decision making? Have you ever used your gut feeling? Uh, what I would say here is that first, actually intuition plays a very important role. Um, that's why actually for me, the, and the context plays a very important role. That's why for me, for example, having an industry collaborator is very important because they have the insights, the background and the intuition a lot about the actually the context. Context is always important, but that's why also um, 
you sort of need to look at the data to play with the data initially, get some intuition on what the data is telling you, which could be also something false because something could be wrong with the data. And that's where the back and forth and the collaborator would actually, or ourselves together, will find out that this doesn't make sense. Having some intuition on what should be or could be happening that will help you also build the models. So you want intuition together with the data and the algorithms and so forth. It cannot just be blind algorithms mm. because mistakes can happen. And if you or you know wrong models are built, and you have to be very very careful on that. Um, and maybe another thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, oftentimes we have an intuition from the particular domain that we are working in, uh, but it's important to keep checking that intuition. It's important to keep checking whether whatever I have done so far in the model, does that make sense or not? If what if the data was not following the distribution that I have in the data that I have? Could the data be out of that distribution? Am I, uh, am I, only serving a very small part of the data set that I see and, and missing the big trends. And sometimes what also helps is getting intuition from cross domains in terms of the issues that could arise or in terms of the speed ups that you could have gotten or in terms of like other technical ideas that were very useful in some other applications, you could kind of bring those in. So sometimes intuition carries over, but I completely agree that intuition is a really important part of uh, building models and, and the data analytics pipeline. And something else that I'm doing also very similar to what Swati just suggested is that sometimes we see patterns in the data that you really have to think twice about what is it, how the data was generated as a response to what, and is there any um, we call this like a distribution shift that has happened in the data as a result of the decision-making process. So in the example, the credit application that I mentioned earlier about my research, uh, a lot of data that we see uh, essentially are already shifted. They're already contaminated because when people apply for loans, they have already strategized. It's never, they never reveal to us like their, um, their true application without strategizing, so. Wonderful. I think we have time for one last question. Um, maybe this is a more process oriented question. So when all of you do research, what is the process like for you to hire a, a research assistant and uh, how do you make your decision on who to hire? So I know the program has a process that, uh, but we are given, um, resumes of students that take a look at and from there you know we see what type of uh, uh, projects we have we ask people to come in and we meet them and we ask questions that are trying to understand why you are doing it what is your background and so forth and then also that includes me and the PhD students in my case because you know I want to make sure that they are also uh, because they work very closely with them and then from there, we make decisions, at least that's the process that I follow. Same, like we see all of the applicants. We also see students who might have mentioned us that, you know, they might want to work with us. We see those applications also. Uh, uh, we look at the kind of projects we have where it would be useful to have an MBA analytic student with that background and uh, assess the need and we meet with students and see, you know, who's a good fit. When I talk to MBA analytic students this semester, uh, some students were naturally very excited about a healthcare project and some students were more excited about like a transportation project or maybe a recommendation system, right? So students often have their own preferences and and so uh, like we try to find a good match.